Welcome to the pilot for pulmonary expert interviews. I'm Dr. David Letterer, a pulmonologist and co-director of the Interstitial Lung Disease Program at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Martinez. Fernando, why don't you introduce yourself? David, I am uh, Fernando Martinez. I'm the division chief uh, at Weill Cornell uh, Medical Center, your partner institution in NYP. Glad to be here. Uh, so, Fernando, I uh, wanted to open and talk about diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And, and I know that um, probably you and I probably have different approaches to diagnosis. And when I talk to colleagues around the country and around the world, there seem to be wide patterns of variation in, in how each individual physician or each individual yeah. center approaches diagnosis. And so maybe you could share your thoughts and, and your practice on how you begin the evaluation. Well, David, as you know, I've been uh, in this diagnostic world a long time. Uh, you were a pup when I was starting <laughs> uh, to work in this area. Uh, and so I've sort of seen the evolution over time in terms of the overall strategies and the approaches. And you're right, I mean, there's a lot of variation in terms of what people do. Uh, and um, I think what I've noticed over time has been uh, a modification of the approach to defining the eye, the idiopathic component. Uh, and you've done a lot of work in this. I mean, you, your blog shows a, a lovely way of actually doing a history in this component. And so I've, I've seen sort of variations in that approach. Um, I've seen the institution and the evolution of imaging criteria. And uh, as you know, those are even evolving now. Uh, in terms of how we invoke those. Uh, I think that there has been also an evolution of the need, the type of biopsy approach. Uh, so I said in that fashion because as you know, a large group of people don't even get biopsies anymore. When I was a young person, and that was a common thing that we did. I think what I, what I anticipate will happen is a lot of that approach is going to change based on two components. And I, I think we're gonna have a drastic change in terms of how the diagnostic process is engaged. And that includes the molecular techniques, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but it also will relate to what occurs with the antifibrotic therapies in non-IPF fibrosing diseases. Because if they work in that component, to some extent the diagnostic process is simplified, becomes a little bit easier in terms of what we end up deciding. And then we start refocusing on ensuring that our primary care colleagues have an understanding of when an ILD can take place and sort of earlier approaches to the process. And it's really been very interesting to see over the course of the last you know, 25, 30 years how this whole field has evolved. Uh, and my sense is some of the variability in terms of how people approach it is going to become increasingly less and less so. I think that's a that's a great summary and overview, and I, I love hearing your perspective on it because uh, I guess maybe as a pup, <laughs> pup, I have a you know a shorter uh, experience and perspective. Um, I've found a great value in very very carefully um, eliciting history. I I think that um, it's still a critical part of the evaluation, uh, asking very importantly about home exposures and workplace exposures. Um, mold and birds causing hypersensitivity pneumonitis, so water sources in the home, humidifiers, hot tubs, water stains, prior flooding, ventilation systems that might be humidified, um, down bedding that we yeah, now know yeah. to ask about yeah. as a potential source for a hypersensitivity I was pneumonitis. asking yesterday in a patient about down bedding I was thinking of. You going, I, I'm oh, now going to use the letter approach. Every time I'm asking yeah, it's it. interesting. Um, and, you know, Probably in most cases not relevant, but uh, probably important to, to think about as a potential bird source for, for HP or hypersensitivity pneumonitis and the detailed occupational history. Right. And then all the symptoms and signs of autoimmune diseases, joint pain, yep. stiffness and swelling, and re nose, dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, morning stiffness in the hands, skin rash, uh, and heartburn, the usual. Um, because I, I think that with a good history and a good physical exam, uh, especially paying attention to those physical exam findings of autoimmune disease on yeah. the fingers and face, um, that we can often avoid a biopsy. And I, I think it's unfortunate when some people do undergo a biopsy when maybe we could have gotten away without it. Um, and before we talk a little bit more about biopsy, you mentioned the evolution of, of CT, CAT scan imaging. Right. Um, and I, in my practice, have seen a lot of variation when folks walk in with their CAT scan on a disc. 
and variation in the type of CAT scan that was performed. Do you want to share your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, yeah. So let me tell you a couple of things. And going back to what you just mentioned in terms of the history, one of the things that I found very instructive at this ATS meeting that we were recently participants in uh, is that part of what I think that the world in this field needs, and you can have an influence in this, David, because you're a key person in the pulmonary fibrosis foundation uh, network, uh, is to be able to provide practitioners that don't work at expert centers where we, we do this uh, on a daily basis, a, a systematic way that they can take to doing this history. And that actually, after the ATS, I went back to look at your blog and see what you had on there. And I think that being able to provide clinicians who don't necessarily do this every day, with a methodology that makes it relatively simple for them to go check, 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 and the components that you just mentioned, um, I think will be incredibly valuable. Uh, because I agree with you. I think that once we invoke something other than the I in idiopathic, the field is different. Uh, the therapeutic approaches are different. The prognostic components are different. You and I have worked in transplantation. It's different in terms of what we manage in that component. So, so I like that approach to that standardization. So. The, the imaging uh, component, I would argue, is best approached in sort of a series of levels. The first, which is uh, what you refer to, is that despite there being a lot of push in the last few years, particularly with antifibrotic therapies, for education and recognition and some of those components, it still amazes me the variation that you see in terms of imaging studies for these patients. And you're right, people will come in with a CT and it'll be sort of a standard pulmonary nodule CT and you'll go like, oh my God, where are the inspiratory features? Where's the prone, you know, where's the expiratory images? Uh, and so that another component that I think needs to be better presented to the practicing community is some standardization of what imaging should be obtained. What are the bare minimum criteria that you need to have an imaging study that you can look at and say, ah, this is a good one for ILD uh, evaluation. Again, I, this is where I think the PFF, Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, can have some influence in terms of providing guidance. There's, in fact, the Blue Journal perspective that's floating around right now, which is trying to standardize the imaging approach for exactly this kind of evaluation. So I think first level is know when you want to get an imaging study. The CT is clearly one of the bedrocks of diagnostic principles. Do it correctly so that you have a sense of how to best interpret the findings. Uh, and then there are all the separate findings that uh, have been around for a long time. So, you know, you'll remember that uh, we did a whole series of studies 10, 15 years ago looking at inter-observer agreements, intra-observer agreements, the same CTs uh -huh. looked at several times. A and the level of agreement w was remarkably poor. My sense of doing this for the last 20 years is that it's a little better, but it ain't dramatically better. Right. Uh, and so I think that we've had some advance where we clearly now understand that if you, your colleagues, your radiologist, sees a pattern that they say, oh, Dr. Letter, this is the classic pattern. There it is, subplural, basal predominant, honeycomb change. Absolutely convinced that's the case. And you look at it and you go, okay, I agree with you. Then I think that now is an accepted uh, pattern. We, get, we all go, check, woohoo, we got an answer there. But as you know, that's not the majority of patients. Right. There are many more modifications, which to some extent, we that have worked on guidelines have introduced complexity by having that probable uh, UIP or possible UIP. And you've seen some of the variation in terms of those components. I think that getting an understanding in the practicing community that here's when you need imaging. This is the kind of imaging you need. If you see this pattern and you agree on this pattern, woo, that's a good thing. The rest requires additional study and modification for us to be able to define exactly what the role of this possible versus probable, you know, not the classic UIP pattern for us to make decisions. I think that's an area where the field's going to move. I, so I agree completely. And there, there are a couple of recent publications suggesting that even patterns that are not the classic UIP, you know, with if they have certain features, extension, extensive traction bronchiectasis, more than a third of the lung yep. involved with reticulation, that the likelihood of histopathological usual interstitial pneumonia pattern is, right. is very high. So I'm, I agree. I'm hopeful that um, the new guidelines that are being worked on might reflect yes, that and help save surgical lung biopsy and avoid okay. it in some people. So let me ask you a related question to that, because uh, it's something you and I have talked about. If you see one of these patterns, it's not the classic pattern, but it has traction bronchiectasis, a third uh, of the lung is uh, fibrosing in appearance, and the patient is 75 years old versus 45 years old. How do you interpret that component? I, I, I think it makes a big difference, 
And that's also where it's critical to go back and integrate the history. Exactly. So if there's really no clue about why they have it, and they're 75 years old, and it may not be that what we typically think of as a UIP pattern on HRCT, but maybe has these other features that new data suggests probably means there's underlying UIP histologically, yep. I'm done. Yep. I don't need to biopsy that person. And I think as we, since you are also involved in this next phase of the guidelines, uh, I think we need to be able to advocate for that approach. I agree. You know, some practicality of, there's a historical feature which is relatively straightforward and a certain imaging pattern. You see that, it's good enough uh, government work. So I wanna get more granular about biopsy and, and kind of next generation diagnostics. Yep. So we talked about, you know, uh, the patient where it's unclear, the, the, the clinical radiological picture is not clear, and we're considering biopsy. And, and let me first say that for surgical lung biopsy, which I think we all agree has been the standard now yep. for, oh gosh, 20 years at least, I agree. Um, that uh, we, we are cautious and appropriately cautious in high-risk folks. So I, I, I think it's important to mention that that there are folks who have extensive fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, getting sick under our eyes, uh, older folks who might be frail, have high cardiovascular risk. Yep. Hint of that, I don't biopsy yep. them. I'd rather have uncertainty than have a serious complication. On the other hand, there are plenty of folks I do send for biopsy yep. if there's diagnostic uncertainty and their risk to me seems low enough. That's my practice. I agree. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I found interesting, even at the ATSs last week or two weeks ago, whenever we were there, there is um, there have been a series of groups that have published, and a lot of these in the surgical literature, oh, you know, VATS biopsies, low risk. And in mm -hmm. Michigan, where I was for many years, we did them as outpatients. VATS were done as outpatients. Uh, and we published that experience with very low complication rates. However, the key to that was, as you just said, if it was somebody who was 80 years old or had multiple comorbid conditions or was frail, we did what you did. We right. said, eh, beep, we're not going there. Uh, and so I think if you're appropriate in the selection of who you want by a series of relatively straightforward criteria for what you think is perioperative risk, and there's a diagnostic uncertainty, I think you're right. I mean, surgical biopsy remains the gold standard. But the, all of those components that you just mentioned, the clinician who's out there viewing this needs to keep in mind. They need to process some of that information before they consider whether a biopsy is going to be uh, uh, recommended for a patient. Yeah. There's a lot of buzz now about cryobiopsy uh, and simply about doing transbronchial biopsy yep. again. What we all used to do yep. um, before surgical lung biopsy came into vogue for ILD diagnosis. Uh, so I, let me mention cryobiopsy and then I wanna, I wanna hear your thoughts. So cryobiopsy, there's been a lot of interest, a lot of publications now, yep. um, all looking at agreement uh, and diagnostic yield. Yep. But I'm not aware of any papers yet where they've compared cryobiopsy pathology to surgical lung biopsy in the same person obtained at the same time. Well, you wrote the editorial on this for the Blue Journal, I guess it was a year ago, on one of these papers that attempted to make that argument. Uh, and I think you're right, there is sort of a buzz regarding cryobiopsy because it's kind of surgical-like, but it's surgery light because it's, uh, it's not quite the same level. You don't have to cut here. You can do it through a bronchoscopic approach. But you're right, it is not a completely benign procedure. Uh, and there is complications, and it's, there's clearly a very uh, intra-observer uh, relationship to complications. Uh, and so the, the key limitations right now, I think, are that we do not have, as you said, a study that compares the gold standard, which you and I both agreed is a surgical biopsy, with contemporaneous cryobiopsy. There are studies that are trying to do that now, but they, those don't exist, which is why, in my mind, I'm still a little bit hesitant in terms of exactly what that role is going to be. Let me mention two last things before we wrap it up. One is, very briefly, there is this very intriguing study of transbronchial lung biopsy uh, from Michigan and I think uh, UCLA, UCLA yeah. uh, where there were six folks who could have probably avoided a, a surgical biopsy. Right. I mean, I, I, we probably don't have to spend too much time talking about it. I think it's intriguing. I think we would love to see more data. That would be a wonderful way to proceed if it's possible, yep. but maybe not ready for prime time. Yep. And then I want to mention the idea of the molecular diagnostics, right. uh, Lancet Respiratory Medicine paper a year and a half ago, uh, new data presented at the ATS meeting uh, in May 2017, just mm -hmm. this month that we're filming, uh, suggesting that uh, a positive result on this molecular classifier using transbronchial lung biopsy tissue um, had a fairly high specificity for di a histological diagnosis of UIP yep. and surgical lung yep. biopsy. That 
data to me is, again, intriguing. I use the same word, uh, promising, uh, and I think might be of use in folks where you think IPF is more likely than any other diagnosis, but not, not certain. That's my sense. Yeah, well, I'll tell you that the, the transbronchial uh, study, I was involved in its design, uh, and those were cases that were highly selected, David, because those were people that already had a biopsy, that we already had done transbronchial. I mean, it was a very narrow population of individuals. So I don't think that we can use those data or a couple of other similar studies that have been published to widely advocate the use of transbronchial biopsy. That's my current bias. It may well work out that way, but I, I don't think we're going to ever see that again. However, I think the bronchoscopic approach is going to start making a recurrence. Uh, I think that if we can confirm that a genomic signature, even on transbronchial biopsy, has a high specificity, that may well be what you and I will be doing because you're going to be doing the history and the careful uh, physical exam, all the components we mentioned. We'll be looking at the imaging features with some expansion in our view in terms of what will apply. And when there's uncertainty, we'll think will there be enough value of a simple bronchoscopic procedure with this genomic signature to give me a UIP likelihood that's very high? Uh, and I think we will then see that pattern introduced in terms of practice and surgical biopsies or even cryobiopsies becoming less and less use, utilized as we synthesize a more limited piece of data. So we'll find out. I mean, that, that there are additional data being collected that is more than just UIP pattern, but it is a, a clinical diagnosis, including the UIP pattern. I think that's where that field needs to go for us to be able to say, woohoo, yep, this I is agree. genomic approach. So a lot of really exciting stuff on the timeline. Oh, cool so stuff. Thank you so much, Fernando, for joining me. That was terrific. Yeah, David, it was a wonderful discussion. I appreciate your inviting me.